Hey, I want to welcome you to the first of our spring series of uh, uh, luncheon seminars. I know that you're going to enjoy them and be uh, illuminated by them and have a very good time. So please join us for all of them and uh, we are, we're going to start right now. Um, Professor Susan Paulson uh, would, is going to come to the podium now to introduce Parry formally. Thank you, Susan. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Polson, and I'm a professor of 20th century U.S. history at the university. Sandra asked me to introduce Mr. Kana because I had used his book in my graduate course last year and was happy to hear that he was coming to Scranton. Some of my students are in the audience today. Perg Connor is director of the Global Governance Initiative and a senior research fellow in the American Strategy Program at the New America Foundation. In recent years, he's been involved in a variety of geopolitical venues. He was in a foreign policy advisory group to the Barack Obama for Presidency campaign, an advisor to the United States Special Operations Forces in Iraq and Afghanistan, and has worked at the Brookings Institution, the World Economic Forum in Geneva, and the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. He holds an undergraduate degree in international relations and a master's degree in security studies from Georgetown University, and is working on a PhD in international relations at the London School of Economics. We all know that the world is in tremendous flux. Ten years into this new century, the United States seems to be in deep economic trouble with a reduced political capacity to address pressing issues. Our wars in the Middle East and our worldwide military commitments are expensive and draining. Authors both American and foreign have been writing for decades of imperial overstretch by the United States. Europe, united by the European Union, has expanded democracy eastward and offers a new model of international cooperation. Yet it too faces problems of rising debt, unassimilating minorities, and demographic decline. China's tremendous economic success in just the past few decades is astonishing. As this new power with more than a billion citizens rises, building a stronger and economic and military capacity, the world watches, wondering what kind of a power it will be. Mr. Khanna has written a book, published in 2008, that addresses these developments. He spent two years traveling to more than three dozen countries, talking to officials and locals, looking for himself how this new world order is shaping up on the ground, and from this wrote an appealing, thought-provoking work entitled The Second World, empires and influence in the new global order. Mr. Khanna sees the emerging geopolitical marketplace as tripolar. That is, being dominated by three first world superpowers, the United States, Europe, and China. Each competes to lead, and one key to success is good relations with what he calls the second world. Those countries of the Middle East, Central Asia, Africa, and Latin America that are energy and resource rich. The superpowers are developing non-military means to win allies and influence. As these second world countries look to the three superpowers, many find China's offer of economic development along with its non-interference in matters of human rights to be attractive. In Central Asia, for example, Mr. Khanna concludes that China is winning through strategy, trade, and co-development. I'm happy to welcome Mr. Khanna here today because he's doing what we all need to do. He's discussing, debating, reflecting on where the world is headed and what positive role the United States can and should play in this new configuration. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Parag Kama. I just want to make sure this pops up. Okay. Oh, there we go. Great. Can everyone see that? 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Professor Paulson, for that uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And uh, it is indeed uh, long overdue that I be here. Uh, America's declining infrastructure, uh, which you hear about so much in the news today, was uh, the reason for my not making it last time. But, uh, but I'm very pleased to be able to kick off the, um, uh, the season and uh, to have been invited by Sondra. We established that we've known each other and, and uh, become good friends over the last eight, eight years at least. Uh, so we go in, in the globalization age that counts for an eternity uh, that, we've, that we've known each other. So um, uh, the, the, the sort of general uh, highlights of my book uh, were just mentioned and, uh, and what I want to do today is to actually not talk about the day-to-day -day events uh, that, you're, that you're hearing about and reading about and debating, which is the state of the global economy, uh, you know, who's winning, who's losing on Wall Street and the financial sector and regulation and healthcare and competitiveness. I want to actually take a big step back and remind um, and, and really focus on what the original theme of this book was, and that's geopolitics. And it's the geo in geopolitics that we often forget, and that's geography. And so what I'm going to do today is walk you through taking that very traditional antiquated lens. Who cares about geography anymore? Who cares about, about those facts on the ground? Uh, after all, we live in a borderless world, don't we? And uh, I will come to the same conclusions I do in my book and talk about the things that are, that are pressing and relevant today in terms of global competition for resources and all of these things. But I'll do it through that very sort of uh, antiquated lens. So, this, this presentation is titled Invisible Maps. It's about the lines that you don't see uh, on the maps that we use. By the way, is that my um, phone? Let me, sorry, let me um, switch this off because it might be disrupting the microphone. Okay. Um, so, you know, I start with the question, do we live in a borderless world? And, um, and this is what you see is a map of the world without any, any lines on it. Uh, but of course, this is the contemporary map. Right now, we have more countries in the world today, more independent nation states than at any time in our history. Um, but for those who I was sort of insinuating earlier uh, see the world as, as borderless, this is kind of the map that we often uh, think of. Uh, you may find it hard to see, but this is an image that you've all seen before. It's the satellite image of the Earth at night. Uh, and so all you have are the, 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 the bright dots those are the major cities of the world. And people think of the, those who think of the world as borderless, basically imagine connected and unconnected spaces. And just these cities, you see the clusters really around, of course, the eastern seaboard of the United States, western Europe, a bit of the Persian Gulf, a bit of India, certainly China's coastal areas. These are the connected spaces and everything else is considered sort of unconnected. And Cities make up most of the world's um, so economy. Take down the room mm -hmm. lights a little bit. This is the only one that will appear dark. So I think oh, oh, okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, and so one could be forgiven, given the fact that just 40 cities in the world, 40 of these shiny dots represent most of the world's economy, you could be forgiven for thinking, well, it's a borderless world. Any one of us who lives in one of those cities probably has the right passport, can get on a flight and go somewhere else. Ah, perfect, thank you. Um, and so you think really, you know, the, the world is again these connected and unconnected spaces. But what I want to remind everyone is that 90% um, of the world, which spoke about 90% of the world economy coming from these cities, what about 90% of the world population? 90% of the world population will never leave the country in which they were born. That's a pretty uh, striking fact that we often forget when we think that the world is borderless. And maybe for us, we belong to that, uh, that uh, 10 percent that, that is able to cross borders or the 10 percent that are migrants uh, and otherwise. So what I want to talk about is that, is that 90 percent for whom borders matter and they often matter violently. Uh, of course, so much of the world's military industrial complex is justified by border conflicts and border disputes. Uh, military spending remains at, at an all-time high in the world and it's not just because of, uh, because of the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. So I believe that when we're out talking about the borderless global economy and, and the borderless nature of uh, problems and solutions and global governance, we need to step back and remember that we have such a fundamental ancient problem that we have neglected to deal with, which is political geography. Just how do we distribute people, resources, uh, territory, and so forth? 
around the world in, in a way that is um, sensible and equitable and could potentially lead to diminishing conflict. Uh, so th that's why I call this approach very traditional uh, in this presentation. So how did we get to where we are and where are we going when it comes to political geography? I want to take a quick trip down memory lane to 1945 after World War II. The world had about 100 uh, nations. Uh, the UN was founded originally with about 50 members. Um, but you can still see that even though Europe, of course, was, had been devastated by World War II, it still held large overseas colonies. You can see uh, French West Africa and British East Africa are large swaths. South Asia is still one. And then over the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we had waves of decolonization, really. Each, each decade, uh, uh, a dozen or more new countries were born. You can see uh, Pakistan uh, and, uh, and India beginning in independence of Bangladesh in 1971. You can see Africa now as many more uh, independent countries and so forth. Um, and then came, of course, the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union. At that point, you had the, uh, the creation of, um, or uh, spinning off, really, of the former satellite um, uh, republics of the Soviet Union into independent countries and the stands of Central Asia that also became uh, independent. And we'll get back to some of those. So today we live in a world where every square inch of the planet is claimed by some sovereign state or, or quasi-state in the case of uh, Kurdistan and Palestine, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But does this mean now that when it comes to political geography and geopolitics, that someone's gain is someone else's loss? And we'll start to answer that question by focusing on what is one of the world's most uh, strategic regions. And that is uh, what, what in geopolitical terms you'd call Eastern Eurasia. So here you see Russia is still the largest country in the world. Many people uh, forget that even after spinning off 13 new independent countries, uh, it, it is still the largest country in the world. And China, as you know, is the most populous country in the world, and they share a lengthy um, land border. What is happening over here in terms of, again, this relationship between territory, resources, uh, and power? Is Russia still the largest country? Well, in fact, as it turns out, uh, the World Bank estimates that Russia's population is shrinking uh, considerably to about 100, from 150, 140 million down to 110 million uh, projected over the next decade or so. It's the largest, most violent demographic freefall in, 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 in modern history. Uh, in other words, Russia is in many ways uh, disappearing. Now, for many of us in this room who remember the Cold War very well, this is not the Russia that we thought of uh, in the Cold War. Um, how could I possibly be claiming that the largest country in the entire world is disappearing? And yet that's exactly what anyone who studies Russian demographics would tell you. Uh, and it's not just that the, country, that the country's population is suffering from uh, tuberculosis, uh, heart disease, old age, alcoholism, all sorts of maladies that are, that are literally exterminating the Russian population. Uh, it's also a self-inflicted wound of bad governance. Now, I want to bring in another reason why Russia on the map, as you see it, really has very little relationship with the real Russia. And that has to do with this little guy who's walking from east to west. Uh, in the Soviet era, as, as Soviet leaders uh, forced people to move east to gulags, labor camps, nuclear cities, all that kind of thing. And now, of course, that the Soviet Union has uh, collapsed, people are voting with their feet. And they're saying, what am I doing in this desolate part of uh, eastern Siberia? I'm going to get up and move west. So the, the few people that remain in Russia, I mean, 100 million is not a few, but it certainly is not... Um, that's less than one-third the population of the United States uh, by comparison. It's less than one-tenth the population of China uh, are mostly concentrated in the uh, western districts of Russia, um, in other words, the European side of Russia. Eastern Russia, uh, which is twice the size of India, has uh, a, a whopping 10 million people left in it. That's it. So. Now, what is happening in this part of the world? I'm going to do, take a brief aside and, and, and uh, talk about a place called Mongolia. Many of you people know of this country as Mongolia, but in the business uh, of mining, they don't think of it that way at all. They think of it as Mongolia, because in Mongolia, you have uh, 
rich resources of copper, zinc, gold, and other minerals, which Chinese companies are moving in, uh, extracting, and trucking out uh, in very large volumes. Uh, most of the businesses in Mongolia that are operating are uh, Chinese front companies or joint ventures with China, and that's certainly the largest natural resource uh, consumer in the entire world uh, today, China. So, in fact, what's happening is that China isn't uh, conquering Mongolia, it's just buying it. And this is a big difference between the 19th, 20th centuries and today. We, used to, we tend to think of geopolitics as being about conquest, and colonies were indeed once conquered. Today, in a globalized world, countries can just be bought. And that's exactly what China's doing. It's buying uh, Mongolia. It doesn't have to conquer it. And I had an interesting experience uh, two weeks ago at the World Economic Forum in Davos, where, uh, where a young Mongolian man came up to me, and he said, we don't like you in Mongolia. I said, why? What did I do to you? And uh, he said, you know, I'm an advisor to the president and prime minister of Mongolia, and, uh, and this presentation um, uh, made its way onto the, the internet, or parts of it, and it was shown on Mongolian television for two weeks, because I guess they don't have a whole lot else uh, you know, to show there. <laughs> and so, you know, many people in Mongolia saw it, certainly the political leadership did, and they saw me uh, up on a stage calling their country uh, Mongolia. They took a bit of offense. But uh, the president and prime minister were there at the World Economic Forum, so he said, you come on Thursday and you, you, know, you, you, you talk to them. I said, okay, great. So I went and I met the president and prime minister of Mongolia two weeks ago, and, uh, and I got to sit down and chat with them for a little bit. And they said, at the end of the conversation, they said, well, thank you for this wake-up call. Because they know what they're doing. They know that they're really selling their country out and that there are certain things they could do to protect their, themselves and to uh, lead to not just sell resources to the highest bidder, but actually benefit from the, uh, from the resources that are coming in, financial and otherwise. But they're not necessarily doing it. So let's apply this logic of not conquering countries, but buying them back to Russia. This is Siberia, the place from which uh, all, the, all the Russians are, are, are leaving. And this is what we tend to think of uh, when we think of Siberia, cold, desolate, icy, unlivable. But what's happening thanks to global warming, and bear in mind, when you talk about geopolitics, you're really talking about the intersection of demography, the environment, uh, uh, natural resources, and these sorts of things. So when I talk about the demographic shifts and I talk about the environment, people, people think of those things as new issues, but they're not. For anyone who, studied geo, who studies geopolitics, those are the very building blocks of geopolitics. That is how you analyze change, is through the lens of mig migration and, and, and environmental issues and so forth, and the consequences those have on politics. So these are not new issues I'm talking about. This is the ancient logic, in a way, of, of political history being applied to modern context. The, the, the impact of geography and the environment and demographics on politics is something far older than nations and borders and the nation state system. And again, that's, that's part of what this presentation is meant to emphasize. But getting back to what has happened here, thanks to global warming, the, the permafrost of Siberia is slowly starting to thaw. And you now have uh, you know, vast wheat fields and agribusiness is actually the fastest growing sector of the Russian economy. It's, the, the economy is certainly not diversified away from oil uh, by any stretch, but, uh, but there is a growing, uh, growing investment in that. So who would that feed? If you're growing lots of wheat in Siberia and there are no Russians, who's it going to feed? Well, it's going to feed uh, what I call uh, the, the beneficiaries of globalization Chinese style. And this is also a part of the presentation the Mongolians didn't like, because all of a sudden, <laughs> Mongolia is not really there anymore. Um, why, what is this? Uh, this is not the map that you have hanging on your wall. Uh, but this could be the effective map of actual control in this part of the world over the next 10, 20 years. Some people tell me that this presentation is actually, uh, uh, you know, really applies to the world today. But I, I say it's another 10, 20 years uh, in, in the making. Uh, and the reason I say that is that every, uh, every year about 60,000 or 100,000 Chinese are crossing the Amur River uh, that separates China and Russia and moving northward. And uh, they're not occupying. Uh, what started, they, they were shuttle traders, they opened their own bazaars, their own health clinics. They used to have to go back and forth, but now they just stay. Russia doesn't really do anything about it. There aren't many Russians there anyway. Uh, 
uh, Chinese men are marrying, uh, intermarrying with Russian women, and all of these sorts of things. And it's become more or less a permanent presence of Chinese. And after all, as I mentioned, in just the northeastern part of China, in the Harbin province, you have about 100 million people. So again, that's 10 times greater than the population, the Russian population of Eastern Russia. So there, it's just this slow, steady demographic uh, wave. And the reason I say history rhymes is because this map was, in fact, the political map of the region 700 years ago. The Chinese Yuan dynasty, led by Kublai Khan, that was actually the Mo Mongol Chinese dynasty, this was, in fact, uh, their effective zone of control. So it's not Siberia, to me it's Sino-Siberia, or it's becoming Sino-Siberia, and it's not a, a future map, it's actually a map of the past. And this is just to remind people that, uh, again, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes, and that borders are, in fact, very malleable and flexible. Um, and really, you know, again, this is, this is globalization Chinese style because it, it's demographic, it's not violent as such, at least not yet, there hasn't been a shot fired in any of this. Uh, but in the globalization age, you're allowed to buy or lease countries and territory. Uh, you probably read today about how um, Arab sovereign wealth funds and, and uh, Asian governments are buying up tracts of land in Africa and Pakistan and elsewhere to grow their own rice and wheat and food to feed themselves and ship it back uh, to their countries. That's become a big part of the grand strategy of small countries that don't have a lot of agricultural land. And that's part and parcel of what's happening today. This is just an example, the biggest possible example of that. So this is one dimension of today's current geopolitical change. Um, but it's also happening, and I want to bring in now the global economy, uh, in other parts of the strategic Eurasian space. What is China doing in other parts of the region to build its sphere of influence? Now, in Asia, historically, I mentioned that geopolitical patterns are older than the Westphalian nation-state system. This is particularly true in Asia. Asian history is much more about empires and hierarchies than it is about sovereign, independent, bordered nation-states. And in a way, despite what, again, what you see on your map at home, what's actually happening is this reconstitution of a hierarchy. And throughout Asian history, it's either been Japan or China. Well, it's China's turn again. Uh, how is that happening, again, in a globalized context? It starts with what I call uh, the global hubs. Now, you remember those dots on the map, those satellite, uh, from the satellite image? Well, a, a global hub are those financial centers of the world that filter billions, trillions of dollars of capital into and out of a given region. We tend to think, of course, of New York, Chicago, Miami, Sao Paulo, and, and London, and Paris as being these, these uh, Frankfurt, as the global hubs of the Western world. Well, actually, the, uh, the Far East has as many, if not more, of these global hubs. You see here, uh, uh, Shanghai, Tokyo, Seoul, Hong Kong, Taipei, Singapore, Sydney. These, these are undisputable global hubs. These are huge financial centers. Uh, and of course, Mumbai falls, uh, India, India falls to some extent into this, into this zone. Um, again, billions, trillions of dollars being funneled in from, from global financial markets and capital markets and developing the region and often connecting some way to China. So by co-opting global capital markets, as of course China has done so well, it's building that sphere of influence. There's another pillar to the strategy, and that is, of course, trade. Uh, China is trading uh, heavily with all of its neighbors, and it's particularly has sought to build strong trade relationships with American allies. So you see I have these vectors going to Japan, to Korea, to India, to Australia. Australia is heavily dependent on exporting uh, natural gas and iron ore and other commodities to China. By far, has become the largest market for Australian exports. But Australia, of course, is an American ally, isn't it? But if you talk to Australian diplomats today, the place for them to go is China, not Washington. You know, they're learning Chinese. Kevin Rudd, the Prime Minister of Australia, speaks Mandarin. Uh, they know where their economic future is, and where your economic future is is very often where your geopolitical future is. So you have, you have countries like Korea and, uh, and Australia saying, hey, you know, we'd like to help America form a dialogue with China. We don't really want to be in any kind of containment strategy against China. That would not be good for us. We're not going to endanger our own existence here. You hear that more and more around the region. So the traditional notion of, 
America, the offshore balancer, America, the, the stabilizing power in the Far East. Psychologically, a lot has changed since the Korean War and the Vietnam War. And we have to start to come to terms with that and realize. Japan is a great example. It's a shocking thing for a lot of people who think that J Japan and, and the United Kingdom really are the two true American allies. But even Japan, and this is something that is very fresh in the news, uh, the new pri prime minister of Japan has come in and he said, you know, we're going to think about a new foreign policy. We're not going to lean on the United States anymore. We might revisit our own military options. Uh, and we're going to undertake a fresh thinking with respect to China. So the first thing that China did was to send their vice premier, who is the heir apparent to Hu Jintao, over to Japan for a very warm and fuzzy summit that happened just about three weeks ago, and, and you probably read about in the newspapers. This is another example of China using that trade diplomacy, because Japan is profiting, wa profiting wildly off of Chinese infrastructure projects and so forth. Um, so trade is, is a major lever for building that, um, that, that hierarchical sphere of influence for, for China. And then there's, of course, just traditional diplomacy. And a lot of that has to do with non-aggression treaties, but also military-to-military -military agreements that China is, is sealing. I'll give you the example of Indonesia. Uh, some years ago, the United States ceased uh, support for the Indonesian military for a brief period over uh, human rights uh, concerns. Well, you know, guess who was on the next plane down to Indonesia? It was the Chinese defense minister signing a defense deal and you know, handing over some military aid. That kind of thing is very common in the region. And again, this broader notion of non-aggression treaties is, uh, is taking shape. And then there's just regional diplomacy. Uh, we tend to think of the European Union as a very dense diplomatic zone. Uh, but Asia is, is, is trying to catch up. Now, a caveat, no region of the world will ever achieve what the European Union has become in terms of a real supranational political entity. And I'll get to that later. But they have what used to be just the ASEAN group, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, is now the ASEAN plus three, the ASEAN regional forum, the East Asian community. Some people are talking about an Asian union. So they're getting there. And China is at the hub of a lot of this diplomacy and is certainly running circles around the US when it comes to sending as many diplomats as it can out to countries, cutting lots of deals, and um, remaining uh, influential. And then there is, once again, demography. Now, as was the case with sending people or Chinese voting with their feet and crossing into Russia, here they're you know, getting on planes. And you've got business people, nannies, school teachers, all fanning out around uh, East Asia. And uh, of course, ever since the Chinese Civil War, uh, what happened with the expulsion of Chinese nationalists and their spread into other Asian countries is that they gradually became the economic elite. So the, 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 really the commanding heights of the economies of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand are really controlled by ethnic Chinese. Uh, Malaysia is in any case, and as a Singapore, largely uh, Chinese populated country. Um, so, but what wasn't there before was Chinese pride and cultural pride. That is strongly resurgent in a lot of Asian countries. You've just had Chinese New Year right now. You have Chinese Day parades also going on in a lot of countries in the region, uh, in, in uh, places where they were previously quite suppressed. Chinese language education was never encouraged in the past. Now it's, it's everywhere. You know, the number of students learning Chinese around the world is, is, is some astronomical figure. So that demographic blending is also happening in the region. What does it all add up to? Again, the map that you have at home shows all of these distinct, discrete nation states. But is that really what the region looks like politically if you add all this up? Not really. What it adds up to, and this is a unemotional comment, I'm just, I'm just stating you know, an analytical point. I believe that you could really compare it to what Japan wanted to achieve after uh, or during World War II. What, what was their goal? It was called the Greater Japanese Co-Prosperity Sphere. We tend to think of it as, as obviously a militant and aggressive design that the Japanese had on the region. And they did carry it out in a very aggressive way and it failed. China has achieved in substance what Japan wanted to. And it's done it again in, in, in largely peaceful ways. Now, there's certainly some backlash against all of this. There are smaller Asian countries that are very worried about, uh, about Chinese sort of muscle flexing and, and very sort of... Um, a muscular diplomacy as well. But by and large, China is getting away uh, with this and really has, has, again, reconstituted what is a very common historical pattern in the region, which is hierarchical uh, sphere of influence. 
again, all of this has really happened non-violently. You wouldn't say that about the Middle East. Uh, you almost never say that anything in the Middle East has happened non-violently. Uh, but let's try and be hopeful and see what we can do about that. Now, here is the, the part of the world, really, that has not been comfortable with its post-colonial and post-Ottoman uh, borders. And um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that, uh, that with the withdrawal, of particularly the French and the British, you had uh, monarchies handed out, borders carved um, through these uh, suspiciously uh, straight lines on the map. And, uh, and the Arab world, which is, which is accustomed to, or at least in, its, in, its, uh, in the era of the caliphates, I mean, grand uh, dominant civilizations that stretched over wide geographies, th these, these constraints of, of national borders are not quite comfortable for Arab nations. What complicates that uh, is, of course, oil. Now, oil uh, used to be, um, in the case of Iraq, uh, one of the factors holding the country together, Saddam Hussein's control over the oil resources of the major post-Ottoman provinces of Iraq. I believe that oil is going to be the main reason for Iraq's uh, eventual disintegration. You're not really hearing a lot about that today. You're not hearing much about Iraq at all today because we're all talking about Afghanistan. But that doesn't mean that Iraq is all better. Uh, in fact, I don't think that it will remain a united country at all. And uh, I wrote about this extensively in my book, and I decided I would give separate chapters for Kurdistan and a separate chapter for Iraq, in a way, because uh, having spent uh, quite a bit of time in, in both parts of Iraq, um, to me, it seems inevitable that the Kurdish people who have been seeking uh, their own in independent state for about 3,000 years are really starting to taste it, and they're not going to be convinced uh, otherwise, especially after the fact that uh, uh, after 1991, if you remember the first Gulf War, we imposed a no-fly zone uh, separating the uh, Kurdish area from the rest of Iraq. Well, most Kurds today were born around or after that time. So they're Kurds who speak Kurdish, who have never been south of that no-fly zone. They've never even been to Iraq, what we think of as Iraq. They live in what we call Iraq and have never been to what we think of when we think of Iraq. Because when we think of Iraq, we think of Arabs, not Kurds. So for a lot of very deep, fundamental, obvious reasons, it's really hard to imagine that the Kurds want to stay. Oh yeah, and of course Saddam Hussein gassed them, uh, and you know, uh, and you know, tried to conduct genocide. So they have plenty of reasons to want to be independent. But oil is the number one reason. These are some of the pipelines uh, that that pass through or emanate from uh, Iraq at the moment. And as you may know, the city of Kirkuk, which is an oil-rich uh, center on the on the border, really between the Kurdish Kurdistan regional uh, government or or zone and the rest of Iraq, uh, Kurdistan is seeking to gain control of their oil and gas deposits. But even before being uh, affirmed that, which may never constitutionally happen, they're cutting all sorts of deals to export their oil and gas uh, through Turkey, through Syria, and elsewhere. Why might this be a good thing? Uh, why would creating an independent Kurdistan uh, be, be a good outcome from, from what, was, what has otherwise been a fairly disastrous uh, Iraq war? Well, for one thing, as I said, it's been a 3,000-year-old struggle for Kurdish uh, independence. Uh, my view is solving these uh, ethno-political dilemmas is better than letting them uh, sort of fester for another few decades. Um, the other is that because Kurdistan is landlocked, it has a very particular sort of, sort of fate or disposition. Landlocked countries really have no choice but to get along with their neighbors if they want to succeed economically. And if Kurdistan wants to export all this oil, it really has to behave itself. It really has to confine itself to the Iraqi borders of Kurdistan and not try and steal from Syria or Turkey or, or, uh, or Iran. Um, so it basically has to get along. I believe that there can be this kind of uh, uh, a modus vivendi and cooperation between a limited independent Kurdistan and its neighbors. And I think there's some evidence that countries like Turkey are starting to understand uh, how this might actually benefit them. Uh, and help to stabilize the region in the long term. The key lesson really from this is that infrastructure, uh, particularly oil infrastructure, which we tend to think of as something that we always fight over, can in fact be part of the solution. That is very counterintuitive uh, today, but I want to imply the inf infrastructure um, uh, sort of um, uh, hypothesis to, uh, to another conflict that we all know um, a great deal about, which is the Israeli-Palestinian situation. 
Uh, here you see uh, you know, what, what you would call a cartographic anomaly. Uh, the Palestinian uh, area, Palestine area, historical Palestine, is one part Israel, two parts Palestine, and the two parts of Palestine, Gaza and the West Bank, are not connected. Um, but as some of you may know, there is an effort underway uh, with funding from the European Union and other donors to create what, what some people call the ARC. And the ARC is a sort of code for, um, for railways, uh, roads, and other sorts of uh, supply connections, infrastructure connections between Gaza and the West Bank, so that, in fact, uh, the two territories could have some kind, of, uh, some kind of physical unity. If that were to be the case, then you could probably better imagine this two-state solution that everyone says they agree with but aren't really doing a whole lot about. You could imagine that happening. Now, the investment would go into an, an independent uh, seaport and airport uh, for Palestine, and allow them to in import and export goods by sea. Without that, without that infrastructure here, without building those new lines uh, on the map, um, such as this arc, I think Palestinian independence would really be futile. So again, independence without infrastructure is, uh, is potentially worth having, but is certainly not fruitful. So again, I think that focusing on infrastructure is the way to resolve or contribute to resolving some of the region's dilemmas. Um, what would it mean to apply this principle to, to the whole sort of Middle Eastern region? Uh, some of you remember the movie uh, Lawrence of Arabia, and, uh, and you remember the scene where, uh, where T.E. Lawrence attacks the, uh, attacks the Hejaz Railway uh, with his, with his uh, Arab uh, tribesmen. Well, the Hejaz Railway today, the Hejaz Railway used to be the symbol of unity in this part of the world. The Ottoman Empire constructed it to transport pil pilgrims from Istanbul to Medina. But if you look at this highlighted little section here, the, the, Ottoman, the, the Hejaz Railway actually used to have a little offshoot that went to Haifa on the Mediterranean Sea. That, of course, today is, is in Israel. But the region used to be that borderless in the, in the Ottoman Empire. And onward it carried to Medina. Today, the Hejaz Railway lies in tatters and ruins. It's a joke. There is no substantial cross-border infrastructure in the Middle East. Instead, as I said at the beginning, there's just very uncomfortable, nationalistic, insecure Arab uh, states. But I think that, again, rebuilding the Hejaz Railway, connecting uh, Turkey through Syria, Jordan, potentially having that offshoot again to Haifa, and then through Saudi Arabia, could be a good step. And why stop there? Why not connect to Cairo? Why not connect to Baghdad? Why not connect to Tehran? Uh, this is what a borderless Middle East, again, would look like, one that is less concerned with fighting over political borders and more concerned with trading across them. And there's one more, uh, that, uh, one more rail line that has just opened, in fact, and this goes from Istanbul all the way through Tehran, all the way to Islamabad in Pakistan. And the, the, the freight trade uh, between these three countries is set to grow from four or five billion dollars to 15 or 20 billion dollars in the next decade or more. So if you can imagine all of these rail lines overlaid on top of each other, you can imagine a far greater incentive for countries to be trading with each other than in fighting uh, ancient uh, border disputes. Uh, and I don't want to oversimplify and just say infrastructure is the key to everything, but we're not doing anything about the infrastructure at all it surely could be an important contri contribution to what, are, what is otherwise a situation of geopolitical gridlock and deadlock across uh, the Middle East. So now let's talk about um, Central Asia, the stands. And what I'm going to do is, is click through, and you'll see all these lines popping up. Some of these lines, some of these pipelines already exist. Others are in the works, uh, on, the draw on drawing boards. What you'll see, it looks very complicated, I know, but what you'll see is that Central Asia, this, this post-Soviet region whose borders were very artificially imposed by Stalin and where identity really doesn't track to political borders at all, uh, needs a new way of defining itself uh, and is, again, as territorially insecure as, as Middle Eastern countries are. Pipelines, again, present that option. Rather than fighting about energy, what you have is a situation where the resources of uh, countries like Kazakhstan uh, and Azerbaijan uh, around the Caspian Sea region, which is landlocked, again, 
are trying very hard to build as many pipelines as possible and gain as much investment as possible into those pipelines so they can connect to the world. Their identity really hinges on their sovereignty and their, their wealth depends entirely on the ability to get these pipelines built. And already some of them have been. If you can see uh, here, this is Azerbaijan. And this is the uh, Baku to BC Chehan pipeline to Turkey. This has become a major uh, artery for energy supply towards Europe. That's just one. And then if you can see Iran, you see that a lot of these uh, potential pipeline routes go through Iran. Why isn't that part of the diplomacy today? Today, when it comes to Iran, we talk about the nuclear program. We talk about uh, uh, certainly an autocratic regime. And we talk about support for terrorist groups. But what we don't realize is a fundamental geographic fact that no matter what their politics, this is a country that uh, is the largest in the region, is the largest population in the region, borders um, uh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Iraq, and the Caspian Sea, and is a bridge between the Caspian Sea and, and, and the Persian Gulf. And despite that geography, what do we try to do? Yes, we're sanctioning the country in certain ways. But we're also avoiding the fact that if we were to negotiate in terms of uh, allowing Iran to be a cross-border energy bridge for pipelines, that might create certain incentives and change the, the diplomatic uh, deadlock that we have with Iran right now. But you don't hear people talking about that because we're not thinking geographically uh, at all. And if you can imagine, it takes a decade to build a major uh, pipeline. You know, you expect it to be operating for 30 or 40 years. Are we really going to be in this situation with Iran in 30 or 40 years? Won't it look kind of silly if you were to looking at the world from the sky and you had all these pipelines built around Iran at enormous expense when you could really just go through Iran? It, you can't avoid geography in that way. And I find our diplomacy pretty silly because it doesn't take uh, this sort of thing into account. But more importantly, what you also see is that um, a lot of these pipelines are now going east, uh, all the way to China. From Turkmenistan to, all the way to China, a new gas pipeline is open. There are two pipelines across Kazakhstan to China. And there is um, an increasing number of pipelines going west as well. So this, this is the region that we have historically thought of as the Silk Road. And to me, the new, the new Silk Road, as it were, that is coming up is, oops, I'm sorry, I just got, there we go. The new Silk Road, is, uh, is sort of an oil slicked Silk Road because of all of these, uh, all of these pipelines. So now let's look at um, the part of the world where a lot of this comes together and where it's actually worked. And that's uh, the European Union. Uh, the European coal and steel community started as just six countries and then eventually grew to, uh, to 12. And uh, there, there are 12 stars in the flag, the blue flag with the 12 yellow stars of the European Union. It's not, it's not actually, the 12 stars don't symbolize the 12 countries, um, it, uh, but, uh, but the EU had those 12 members uh, for the bulk of its history. But today, there are 27 members of the European Union. There are, uh, it has about 450 million citizens. It is the largest trade bloc and free trade zone uh, in, in the world and has a larger uh, collective economy uh, than the United States and a population that's 50% larger than the United States. So in other words, to me, what Europe has made itself through bringing down borders uh, is, is what I call a sort of a European commonwealth or a European empire almost. And the reason I think of it as being an empire in, in the good sense of the term, if there is a good sense of the term, uh, is because of the influence that it's having around its uh, periphery. If you look at the light blue zones, uh, if the Balkans there, uh, Western Russia, Turkey, and North Africa, these are the areas which are not members of the European Union, but which are at least two-thirds or more dependent on the EU for their trade and investment. So let's start with uh, North Africa. Every year you have uh, about or every year or two, one new oil or gas pipeline from a North African country like Libya or Tunisia or Algeria connecting to France or Spain or, or Italy. That to me represents a deep uh, infrastructural connection uh, across the Mediterranean Sea. These countries may never become part of the European, European Union, but when you travel there today, you certainly won't hear them celebrating the notion that they're part of the so-called Middle East. These are countries that say we are North African, you know, or we want to be part of this Mediterranean Union. And it was uh, 
President Sarkozy of France, who, who in the politi was the first person politically to float this, the idea of the Mediterranean Union is sort of ancient, but he, he in recent years has brought up, and I think he's right. I think what is happening is that North Africa, and the, again, these are Arab countries that we tend to think of as being you know, sort of volatile and dangerous, but in fact, thanks to enormous amounts of European investment and the, uh, and the, and the economic relationship they have, I think that that region is generally stabilizing and integrating uh, with Europe into this Mediterranean Union. Um, another critical uh, uh, sort of uh, part of the European uh, story is uh, Turkey. Now, we tend to think of Turkey as, as having its sense of self-worth almost hinge on whether or not it becomes a member of the European Union. Uh, I think that's completely wrong. Uh, Turkey is a very proud ancient civilization. It is very aware of its geography as this bridge between East and West. And in a way, Europe can't even be a superpower without having Turkey on its side. I, I pointed to the baku Chehan pipeline earlier. There's another pipeline called the Nabucco pipeline, which is being planned, which would also pass through Turkey. So Turkey realizes that it is increasingly the bridge for 20, 25 percent of uh, European energy supply. And it's absolutely crucial to Europe's energy diversification away from Russia. So to me, it's not really a European superpower. It's a Euro-Turkish uh, superpower. And this is all to the good for Turkey and for, um, and for Europe. But even if Turkey never becomes a member of the EU, as you can see here, it's so vital strategically for Europe that they will have to find some kind of partnership. But I wouldn't count on Turkey actually ever becoming a member. And I think that both sides will ultimately actually be happy with that because Turkey, being such a pivotal sort of geographic bridge, will, wants to preserve as much foreign policy uh, autonomy as it can. So now we're going to look at some, uh, some of the crazy things that are happening around the world today that your maps also don't uh, show you. Uh, difficult to see, perhaps, but India we think of as a great rising power and a vibrant democracy. But what I just showed, dropping down from Nepal and colored in, in blood red very intentionally, was the spread of, uh, of Maoist insurgencies. Um, and the, the, uh, the, the, the mixture of tribal insurgencies and Maoist guerrillas has led to uh, a fundamental destabilization of about 10 of India's uh, states. And that is, again, something that's not depicted on the map. These are not secessionist movements, but they're highly, highly um, uh, disruptive to the success of Indian democracy. And I wanted to point out to the internal frailty and instability within a major uh, power in the same way that I did for, um, for Russia. Uh, what are the other places where, uh, where the map of the world is really falling apart? Uh, one has to look at Congo. Uh, one of the three, I'll, I'll talk about um, the two largest countries in Africa, Sudan and Congo. Uh, Congo, as, uh, as one uh, analyst wrote, uh, Africa's largest country does not exist. I think that is the most accurate description of the Congo that, that one can say. Um, because what's really happening here is that what I've just, just done is sort of break it up into little parts. What you find is that there are various parts of Congo, the Kivu province in the east, which is more uh, where you have Rwandan and Burundi uh, troops and rebels moving in and out of the area and controlling its resources, the Katanga region of Congo, which is more tied to the Zambian economy than to Congo, and the Kabinda region, which is uh, more connected to Angola than it is. What is left, really, of Congo? Not a whole lot, actually. And uh, it's experienced this uh, you know, horrible civil war over the last decade in which uh, you know, five or six million people have died. It was even called Africa's World War. But of course, no one in the West has really been paying attention to it. But I wanted to show how, again, uh, Africa is, again, actually even, has even more suspiciously straight lines on the map than the Middle East does. And most of those don't really represent the reality on the ground in Africa. Let's go back to, uh, to Central Asia and talk about what's happening here. Now, there are major operations going on, military operations in Afghanistan. Um, but it's been about, we're about eight years into the war there. And, uh, and there has been very little resolution to the question of Pashtunistan or Pashtun nationalism or the fate of the Pashtun people. Pashtun people straddle both sides of the Afghanistan-Pakistan border. Simply reaffirming the sovereignty of Afghanistan or shoring up the Karzai government or helping Pakistan stabilize its politics 
none of those things really, in the way that we're doing them, get at this ancient issue. Like the Kurds, the Pashtun situation um, is, is as old as the hills. And this is the flag that flies in many Pashtun minds. Now, Pashtun nationalism waxes and wanes. They, they don't have the capacity to run their own country as such. But the reason I point to this is that for a substantial swath of the border region between the two countries, there still is no good political settlement. And the idea of a Pashtunistan is really as good as anything that's, that's being done right now. Uh, one might say the same thing about uh, Baluchistan. And Baluchistan is a conflict that we hear much less about. And the Baluchi population that's concentrated in southwest Pakistan uh, has been fighting um, an insurgency there since uh, really uh, since the 50s and 60s, and particularly in the 1970s, which has been very violently suppressed. This is the Baluchi flag that I put up there. And this summer in July, uh, Baluchi rebels attacked a Pakistani military garrison ripped down the Pakistani flag and put up this flag. Again, will there be an independent Baluchistan uh, that is going to be recognized uh, by all the countries in the world and a member of the United Nations? Probably not. But are we doing anything to address their, their fundamental concerns? Also, very little is being done. So I want to show these, these flags in a way that, that better represent the psychology of the people in those regions than, than what we see on our own maps. Um, this jumps back to Africa, to Sudan. Um, Sudan is another sort of post-colonial uh, uh, construction, which you know, presently has three civil wars. Uh, people, very few people realize that beyond uh, Darfur, which we hear a lot about, actually in eastern Sudan there is a civil war going on, and in South Sudan as well. South Sudan is the one that's likely to become an independent country. I'm not sure what they're going to call themselves. But uh, next year, there's a referendum scheduled for 2011, but, and it's very likely to vote itself independence. What helps their case is the fact that China has just uh, cut a deal to build a pipeline from southern Sudan uh, to, the, um, uh, to the Indian Ocean. So if and when they declare independence, they have that economic uh, lifeline. This is interesting, of course, because we all know that China is a major backer of the Sudanese regime. The Sudanese regime is the one that's trying to prevent South Sudan from being independent. So there you have China playing both sides very cleverly. Um, now, um, there's one more country that might be born in coming years, Greenland. Greenland is a, is a possession of Denmark and has only 60,000 people. But just this past summer, literally six months ago, Greenland's uh, residents voted themselves self-governance rights from uh, Denmark. So this is the, you know, the, the penultimate step to declaring independence. And given the vast oil and gas resources in the Arctic Ocean, and you may remember that Russia went and you know, tried to plant a flag at the magnetic North Pole in 2007. They apparently were off by a, by a mile or two. But the point being that Greenland sits uh, very nicely to uh, have uh, sovereign control over a lot of those resources if it becomes an independent country. So one could, what people say that Greenland is going to be the first country born of climate change. So starting to, uh, starting to wind down or, or, or wrap up, what does this all sort of uh, mean? The way I see it, geopolitics is in fact like uh, climate change. It is this force that slowly and, and almost imperceptibly changes uh, the world. And again, it's about finding this balance, or what I would call equilibrium, uh, between people, uh, resources, uh, territory, and so forth. And I think that we will continue on and on in search of that equilibrium. And we fear, but we fear that. We fear uh, civil wars, we fear changing borders, we fear learning the names of new countries, uh, all of these things. But in fact, the inertia, the inertia of our present system in which we have largely arbitrary borders is a far more violent one, a far more violent one than if we were to diplomatically and infrastructurally uh, address border conflicts. I think that if we want to live in this so-called borderless world, we should be focusing not on the lines that are on the map as we see it, but in building all of those lines that cross it. That's the only way in which you will ever have a borderless world. Uh, thanks very much. I'll stop right there.